Hi, I'm Matt Patches, movies editor of Hollywood.com, and I'm here at the Haven Rooftop Bar at Sanctuary Hotel in New York City. And this is Rambling On, a roundtable discussion where we gather a lot of smart, creative people, sit them down, and pick their brains. Uh, this week, we're sitting down with some amazing producers. You know, one of the most important roles in a movie, but perhaps one of the most mystifying ones as well. Thank you all for being here today. Really appreciate it. So my biggest thing, and I, I found this when I started working in, in the film world, and maybe you did too, was trying to explain to people what exactly you do for a living. I know my mom still doesn't know anything about the movie world. Um, so for all the moms out there, what, when you start a project, what is your role? Our answers will all be different. Yeah. Um, I work with two other directors. We're all directors and we rotate for each other. The crap that we put ourselves through to make movies, I wouldn't do it for anybody if I didn't love them because there's not any real reward from it. It really isn't. <laughs> it's not. That's it's, it's so not, painful. It's you not really have to. So basically, <laughs> like, should yeah, you have first. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's the worst <laughs> job ever. No, and then yeah, we, so we're three directors who rotate as <laughs> producers for each other. And since for 10 years we've been working together, going on 10, and like when one's directed writing his feature, the other two are directing or producing commercials, and we're splitting the money three ways. We've been doing that for 10 years. And Will you only produce each other's material? We produce outside. We produced one for a director named Alistair Banks Griffin, which was something radical. It had like six lines of dialogue, an hour and a half. It was uh, based on William Faulkner's as LA Dying. It premiered at Cannes in 2010. Um, so but you're the, basically producing as a collective. Yeah, I mean, we just, basically, you're a filmmaker, it's not rocket science. You should be able to do every job, in my mind. I agree. And it's like, your job as a producer is to make everybody's job easier. So you're really just fighting for your friends. You should be, because you're hustling. Like, you know, I, we all make movies for little money, but we're able to shoot on 35 anamorphic and cut traditionally, because we're hustling. Like, we're sitting in Kodak for a week, waiting for them to talk to us, and they finally do, and then they hook you up. And then, for the, if it, after the first film it does well, then they continue to give you stuff. And then hopefully you get to play with a bigger canvas. It's about arts and crafts with other people's money. You might as well have fun with it. <laughs> and do you, do you guys feel like that's your role as a producer? You have your hands in everything? Is that part of the job? Yeah, I, mean, I think ultimately it's about you're managing people, time, and money. And it's just at what, what stage of the movie making process that is. If it's in development, then you're, you're, you know, like, you've spent a certain amount of money to get an option. Uh, so a clock starts ticking. So then you just have to manage the people, time, and money in that, in that part. Then pre-production and production and post now. You hope you have enough time to edit your movie, which is not always the case. The whole shebang. I think they're different, they're different producers, I think. I think they're bottom-up producers who are kind of, it's more of a creative process and you want to make movies and you're like the filmmaker producer, so you learn by fire. In that you've done it all the wrong ways, or, you know, whatever. You've, you've gotten somebody's $5, $10, 500000 or a million dollars and you kind of figure it out and you, you get better as you continue to go. And I think there are producers who are producers where they have the pieces. They know access to talent, they have access to money, they, they kind of are more the executives. And I think there's probably an argument on who are stronger <laughs> as producers. Um, I'm a bottom-up producer. I've made a movie for 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, a million, like, you know. Um, so I think I have a different, I'm probably closer to Josh as far as, you know, the experience is, let's go get some money and make movies with my friends. Yeah. And that's kind of how I've gotten, you know, where I am, but I do think there are other ways to produce, and I think that at the end of the day, the biggest thing is you're the responsible person. Like whoever, when you're the producer or the producers, it's your job to get something from a script disseminated to the people in whatever way you do that. You're servicing the director. I mean, yeah. You're, you're, you work for the director on an independent level. Yeah. On a studio level, it's very different. It's very different. Because you're working true. in between the studio, you're the buffer between the director and the studio. You just, like, you want to look back and make sure that the, produ the director never, ever said, I didn't have this, because it's all on you. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, it's a hustle, and it's like... But even on an indie level, and I feel like I'm a buffer between the financier mm -hmm. and the I was gonna director. Say, I feel like I have as much responsibility to the financiers who come in for each of our films as I do to the director. And honestly, maybe that's a problem, and it's certainly been an issue on Challenge. a number of the films <laughs> that we've done, uh -huh. for sure, but... You guys give up, you guys give a final cut? We have final cut. Yes, the director yeah. does. Yeah. No. Oh, that's the crazy. Have right. the producers that's have crazy. That's yeah. crazy, dude. That's <laughs> crazy. Yeah, for no producer. money. But I yeah. think, but I think, it, but they're not, the these aren't for no, I mean, I don't know what you consider no <laughs> like money. Five, but it's below $5 million. Okay, no. The, these are, Student. well, no, they have been about below $5 million, and we wow. still yeah, had. Wow, that's crazy. I think, yeah. I think, again, I think, you know, it's, it's that finite balance. I think, you know, um, I feel uh, responsible for the, the investors because people invest 
It depends. Sometimes people invest in the director. I love this director. I love their work. Here's a right. $2 million. Whatever he yeah. wants. Then that's great. But when you're the person who <laughs> sit in the room and you say, I'm not going to lose your money. Right. I'm going to do as best as I can to make sure that this becomes a viable product and it gets distributed and makes its money back or as you know we, that's the goal you do feel this burden to me that's of kind the essential of you, can't, you can't legally say that to anybody because it's a high risk investment of course so of course but you still feel that, uh, you still yeah, you, I, I mean I don't I you want everybody to eat there's definitely the goal that yeah. that if you're able to make your money back for your investor, then they'll come back for more. Right. Right. Exactly. You certainly, no one exactly. wants to burn right. any kind of and I think bridge women or leave anyone way. unhappy. I think with their men are more balls yeah. to the wall, kind of like, look, thank you, that's what's up, we're gonna go make this movie. I think women producers have a different slant, I found, than the guys are like, Is that right, because of the industry and how they have to work in it? No, I think guys are like Rambo. It's like, we have toys and money. <laughs> like, let's go. Like, he, just, he just wants to shoot it. <laughs> like, we Why toys, are we not shooting something right money. now? Well, <laughs> all we really need is some tips. And this is great. Let's go have a ball. <laughs> yeah. And I think, right. I think women are a little bit more. Yeah, I don't know. I just find it that we. I think it's that all I, circumstantial. It's diff- true. That too. But I find it. I worry a lot about the investors and what they. You I know, worry a lot about the investors. Right. Yeah. Of course, you worry about the investors. You're also, okay. I mean, for me, <laughs> I worry about. <laughs> of course, I worry about the investors. You know, okay. I've had a lot of them come back and make okay. movies again. And they like going to Cannes, and and they're like actually filmmakers as well. Okay. And doing the, one of them is directing movies. Had a short at Sunday. It's like exactly. everybody okay. does everything, but. You also, like, at a certain point when you move really quickly, like, sometimes, like, you don't know what's going to happen. That's true. Sense. So, you're, you're always protecting your director. I mean, you know what I mean? It's like, and you're in, if you protect your director and you give them the space, you'll be able, your investor will be happy because there's no reason for your director to have failed. I think there's also a trick to finding the right director, the right writers to work with because, uh, you know, Kind of going back to what Josh said earlier, you're you're basically out there killing yourself for right. for no nothing tangible. Right. You know, to give someone to a, like make their dreams a huge come true. Chance. You're like you're a the director, chance. and, and, yeah. you, and have also, were, well. exactly, yeah, you have to know that you were your dreams as well. Exactly, but you have to know that you're that's that true. you're putting your effort into someone who is going to really make the most that's of a, it. I think that's a bit know. of a difference. I think your situation is like at least for me. I feel like if the director is like the quarterback. <laughs> and the producer is like the coach. If the team wins, it's because the, the director did. Oh, it's fantastic! If you lose, it's who produced the shit. <laughs> it right. really is like. Right. But, I, at least but from, who? But who picked the quarterback at, at draft time? True. You know, and, you so. know what I'm saying? So yeah, <laughs> and, and that as well. So um, I, yeah, I, I definitely feel like there's more there's more of the responsibility and less of the glory in so the producing. I look role. at I look yeah. at it like the quarterback <laughs> is the producer actually. Because like the coach is calling all the plays, coach is drafting all the people, coach is putting the team together. You're a soldier of the director. Fuck yeah, man. I mean, I, for me, it's like I want to be happy going to work. But if I, can, you didn't I feel can happy, I would get a real right. job. You know what I'm saying? I can say this much: everyone uses their model and their team as like as, as a conversation point. Like you know what he does, you know, in that particular team that he works with. Like everyone knows them, knows of them, knows their work, and it's something that's rarefied. And people want to have that. Like I think you want to feel like you work with people that you love. And I could be broke for the rest of my life, but I get to work with these people every day. I think Definitely. that's what everyone wants to feel, and they have that. Obviously, there's a there's a struggle, there's a fight that you guys have, and you're being pulled in all sorts of different directions. So, what initially brought you to producing? Why producing? What's the attractive part for you guys? For, for me, it was really uh, that balance of like the creative and commerce, which I just find endlessly fascinating. And it's you know it's that like that tug, uh, which every movie it's a different feeling because ultimately I think you know I love being part of creating something but you know at the back end of it we're still making a widget that's going to have a perceived market value to somebody and our investors certainly so it's figuring out that balance uh, I just find to be endlessly fascinating and is there anyone who got into it for the creative side of it sure. that just wants the creative stuff yeah of course I, I think most of us have like a very kind of production and hands-on oriented backgrounds like I don't think any of us really started as assistants and rolled through the agency system or anything like that um, or it came up from pools of cash because right I, right right you were just born into wealth right no. No one like I mean there that. is there, there is that segment yeah. which is yeah. You yeah. know, hey, Helpful. awesome, right? great. I'm, I'm really, yes, <laughs> I'm envious is all I can you say. Walk, you got to know you walk away. I walked away for uh, Martha could have made a year before. And I walked away. I was like, fuck this. I'm not, I don't you need to. You want to do it the way no, you want to do it. No, that's not even that. It's just like, I got no respect for you. It's like you're giving me money so you can have a credit. 
It's like okay, this is what I'm gonna say. You're gonna have that conversation. If someone gave you free money. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm gonna be no, honest. Not free money. There is, no, no, this, this, this is the issue. Like, I feel like if there was a fashion, so we're talking about producers who actually make things and producers who pay for it. Yeah. I feel like if there, if a fashion designer had to put their investors on their label. That would be a problem. Yeah. I feel as a producer, right. somebody put in it because you paid for it doesn't right. make it. You don't get to put your name on the label. Right. And but the producer credit becomes this this you know this 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 asset that everyone wants because they want to be able to say that's what they do and they really don't do it. All they did was cut a check or file money, and that you know that runs into like the co-executive producer space. Right. But everyone wants this producer credit one because it comes right after the director, you know, <laughs> and it, it has that kind of prominence and it allows them to you know I think it's it's very abusive I think when people pay and I almost walked away from a few situations because of that like but I think the it's thing insulting. is if people this is like a sensitive topic for me because if people don't pay or if you don't find people to pay then you can't get your movie made of course not but, so, but you got to also get a credit that's appropriate for what I you're think you should make the contract right. a wiki doc the, the this way everyone still, will know right. Right. I think you put the contract up on a wiki doc so everyone knows like no I produced it and I closed your money and that's why you got the credit. Yeah, they, have, they have they have this thing now. Like, like when you when you with the Oscars and stuff, they ask you the director answers right. questions, you all answer questions the, and the shit. entire creative. But the thing team. is they right. should carry that over to the spirit awards. Because that's really where our world lives and that's yeah. the only time you get acknowledged. So it's like that stuff should but be But don't they do that? No, they no, absolutely they do not. They do not. Nope. And that's why everybody fights for the producer credit because everybody wants to be on stage. Like to accept the award, you cannot accept a spirit award as unless, as unless you're. I don't necessarily think it's about being on stage. I, I think it's. I mean, for, for whatever, for, for like, I think it's just about being like, like straight up. You know, it's like just who did it. No, that's no, it. I'm, I'm, right. but I'm saying the and person who the person who's financing it, they're financing it because they want to buy into an experience. Well, sometimes, I mean, I, 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 sometimes, sometimes, sometimes yeah. I find it. Who wouldn't? But I, the but the the point is is that like when we did it after school like. Our investors were all like kids. Like I never met any single one of my investors like till a week before I made the movie. Never met any of them. Some of them I only really talked to on the phone. But on after school, it was a lot of kids who just wanted associate produce credits, co produce credits, so that they can learn. And that was the right approach to know like where they were. They didn't go to film school. You know, that they, was their film school. That was that exactly was what their film school. And a lot of them now are like lead producers on movies, bigger movies, and running shit. You know what I'm saying? But it's you got It's like what's the best way to sell it? You know? And then you set a model from that, and, and instead of having lawyers jump in, but the lawyers the worst. It, it gets hard because you start building a coalition. Like this person has this piece, and this, and it's not just always a financial thing. And then all of a sudden you have this. A sl I mean, all of a sudden you have a lot of you have eight producers. Yeah, you have a lot of cooks in the yeah, kitchen. Who's, yeah, who's so, responsible? Which you know is made. is good and bad because I think that I do think very definitively that different people have different strengths. Like I know that they're. There are weaknesses that I have and, and absolute like strengths that no one can touch me on. So, well, you know. I Jumping mean, off something you said earlier about like picking your team and really investing in a director, investing in the people that you want to work with. How do you guys as producers find the projects that you want to do, the right scripts, the right directors? How do you know and, and how have you made those choices in the past? I mean, directors come to us with their projects, with passion projects, with their scripts, and then the agencies send us a million different projects, most of them crappy, you know, with some exciting, some not so exciting directors attached. But most of the stuff that we've actually gone into production on are projects that we've sourced ourselves, whether they're book adaptations or, you know, graphic novel adaptations, you know, or other producers coming to us with projects that they love. And then we go and attach the director and all of the talent. So every, every sort of way. And just in the past, like, working with creative talent, you know, Josh said something really interesting about you never want to have to say no to a director. And you want to find people with a real vision, with real passion for the project that they're making. But does your job involve saying no sometimes? Oh, does it involve collab? What's time. that collaboration like? Sophia says no a lot. Have, I literally have shirts that just say no. It's just like, I just walk I around with signs. No. Okay, I, so I just walk around with signs that just, just kind I'm of like, point here. stop asking. No. Stop no. asking, because no. the answer yeah. is no. Well, I think it also has to do with the experience of the director. I mean, like, you know, I've been on shoots where a, the director, we go scouting, and the director's like, "It'd be great if we could just get like, like a techno crane and and light from like light the whole street." And it's like, "That's that'd be that would be great. That You're right, but great. that's not this movie." Right. Yeah, there's ways. Happen. There's ways to deal with it. Yeah. Like you basically say what the situation is. And on after school, we never said no. We we cut traditionally on film, like, and then like, but what changed was when we did Martha. Antonio produced Martha, so he had some perspective. 
So like we were fighting and killing ourselves but to get more. But you guys trust each other. Of course we that's, do. That, that, you guys that's are the like blood brothers. brothers yes. you know? so but we, like, that took ten years. If someone that's says no, and then you know, or you can't, or like, all right, for real, like we can't do this. It's a trust there. Like right. you know right. what? I trust it's you. Not, yeah. It's not a pushback of well, why like not? Just no. Let me see the yeah. Right. Right. yeah let no, me see we put it this way. We had no. We went to do Simon Killer. I moved to Paris a week after Martha. Tony hands me an outline. We have a great, great investor who just supported. Like he was on the floor with us, and but literally, Tony's like, I want to shoot in the Louvre. I was using the Museum d'Orsay. We shot privately for free in two weeks. They proved it. Like, walked through the like everything. You know what I'm saying? Everything is possible. I agree. Everything. If you love somebody, you can do whatever it is. And it's like it's that's how you have to treat it. Like, I think that's the secret. You just say yes. Love. It's where where are the no comes. <laughs> What's up? No, I think he's into. I just I, I I envy you. I think you just have a very special situation because I. We think, didn't have it special from the beginning. We used the same crew for eight years too. We no, weeded saying, out yeah. personalities. Right. And stuff. But I agree with that. I mean, I I approach everything as like. Whatever that director wants, I'm gonna try to get it, and yes, and yes, that, yes. it just doesn't always but work it, out that way. But it does. You say it no, does. or you say we can't, because you know you don't. I don't start with no. I just always start with I. We can't. Like you know, it, it's at a, it is it is at some level of a loss. If we do this, then we won't have the ability to do this thing or whatever. Right. And or then it's, it's like, we'll do, okay, we'll try again. So you sometimes you get such a push where you have to get to like. No, like right. no, this can't happen. Well, I, I think basically where I was coming from before was I think that we've probably all had experiences with with uh, directors or producers that we've worked for who don't have as full an understanding of like where the money should go or where it can be actually best utilized for the best of the film, and then all of a sudden you are fighting your own team to try to make what they want to happen. Right. And, you know, those are really hard lessons to learn, but I think that that does come into play once you have built a trust with directors that you're working with, that it's like, if I say that we really can't make this happen, you just implicitly understand that I have killed exhausted. myself yes, right. to try to make Every, it happen. Right. And um, I mean, I think a lot of it is about respect. I've had some amazing experiences with directors who trust like that you are doing everything within your power to actually get them what right. they need. Mm -hmm. And that's an amazing relationship. And then I am like now in a situation where directors completely don't trust anything they say. They, we say they've produced their own films. They think we're like an endless faucet for money. Right. And they always are like looking around the other corner for, for things that we're saying are just not possible or not good. And it's a terrible, yeah. incredibly upsetting relationship when you put years into something yeah. and someone keeps um, undermining, undermining it. it. I yeah. feel like at the end of the day, for me, a producer is like a problem solver. It's just the, the things that will always happen and the things you don't expect. What, what are the things that you always think are gonna get screwed up that you find yourself preparing for each time you make a movie? You're like, an issue way more than you think you are. Totally. Like, Every day is going to go long. Yeah. <laughs> how, how long is a day? I don't think most people know how long like a true indie film day could it be. Depends. It should be 12. It should be 12. It should be 12. However, it'll be yeah. usually yeah. like I mean, 16. With, with an independent crew that's non-union, you negotiate all your, your your deals ahead of time, how much grace you get per week, and then you have like the head person you talk to about if you may go over and like can you get a little bit more grace and like can, yeah, can you be flexible. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes they're not if the conditions aren't good. The best trick that I learned is like always hire um, a, a, a chef, like straight out of school. They make a menu for the month, you test the food, then you show the entire crew, because the, the, that's the one thing they complain about, even if they're mad about something else. You show them the menu ahead of time, you show them the list for Crafty, and you say, is this okay? And if you have a problem with this, we can make changes. So a producer feeds people. Is, yeah. that, uh, is that a big part of the job? It's, it's, a, it's a ridiculous amount of, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous percentage it, it, of the job. On set, yeah. you, I, so many fires get are get started, or the, the level of flexibility with your crew, and it's always G and E. I mean, shout out to Gene. but G and E <laughs> is like the guys who set up the lights. The guys and this and this is why they're like there's no create for them. They're doing work. You know what I'm saying? Like they don't. They're not like the production designs. You know they, they, there's labor. so for them they're just labor, and they're like, look, I'm what? here. You got to make sure I you know I eat well, and I'm not dealing with no. Yeah, I think the lighting, the crib, the luxury bar is very creative. I mean, like there are some no, they extremely are, creative they people. They don't get the credit. I think that they because they tend to turn over on different jobs much faster than anyone in the production team or anyone in the art department. You know, there is, it, it, you, you, you really have to work extra hard to make them part of your yeah. team. Yeah. You know, uh, it's, yeah, it, you can find, I, I've found amazing people that I've just been look like just cold calling, rolling calls like all day long looking for gaffers and I've found the most amazing 
people. And then there are people who I've known for years, and I'm like, why are you giving me such a hard time over right. the yeah. Twinkies? Yeah. You know, that's, and, why you hire, yeah. that's how you hire isn't, a isn't really part of great your, production yeah. manager. Isn't part of your job to put them in difficult situations? Like the way you make movies, and maybe you can tell specific stories about this, but I feel like you do end up making choices that make making movies difficult because of what you're trying to achieve I, on I film. I think you lean, if you have people who are competent and are or are beyond competent you definitely ask way more of them you know there's there's often a situation where there was a department who might be a little weaker and you wind up like throwing all these money and resources and then kind of shorting the department that's super self-sufficient yeah. because they can manage on their own and um but, but then those sweet. are the people that you try to keep bringing with you right. over and over and over again and that's um, as honest as possible in the beginning honesty is yeah you just tell the them what's, and, and you and you play the best offense by like like telling them what's going on we have no and money, if they're not we down, need a lot of help no, or, you, you know, you're transparent you say this is what we're working with and and like this is what to expect this is where you're staying like, it's gonna you be let them really know who hard. they're rooming with you let them pick that stuff <laughs> you let them know like what we do with after school was, was a great example for us was antonio went around to help everybody with jody our dp and photographed every setup. So it was with them modeling in it, so that we were able to articulate to the entire crew what every shot was, and then we had pictures of the whole location and where the equipment was gonna be staged, That's where amazing. everything was living. But you do that in prep. You, you, you show everybody everything, so nothing is lost. But have the movies that you guys work on that aren't as like close-knit families, is there that mm -hmm. same kind of relationship that develops well, throughout a movie? Have you seen I that happen? Crew, I think the crew, uh, yeah. The crew, the, the, the crew is smart. They'll realize if you're bullshitting them or not. I think a lot of crews feel like they're getting squeezed sometimes. Like you have more money than you're paying me, or you have more resources, and, right. you know. So they can. But once people know who you are and you're, you're earnest in what you're saying, and you have integrity, they'll tend to work with you. Like, look, guys, you know, and they, and they like, just cut the shit. And I think if you can talk to your crew, and you, especially if you, as a producer, I don't. At some points, you need to. It needs to be your voice, as opposed to your UPM or someone like. They need to know, like, look, I am the person with the checkbook. I am the person making the decisions, and I'm telling you, this is what we can do. On the other side of it, though, I think that they, they also have to like the director. And I've been on crews where they don't like the director, and then you're just like, it's like it's just. Well, do you end up having to play <laughs> play the parent at some point Absolutely. to the crew? Absolutely. I think a big part of being a producer is keeping everybody's morale up. Morale you know, high, yeah. If morale gets low, then the crew is unhappy, and so you're coming up with ways, you know, to. To take everybody out for drinks, you know, big, you know, crew dinners. You know, it makes a huge things. difference. Like yeah. really small things like that make a huge difference. Or you know, margarita midday. Where everybody yeah. feels <laughs> margarita midday. Drinking, but, really? I'm telling you. No, well, that's the one thing when you're like on the... location. You want they like want you give them beer. Like you can, when they get back to the hotel, every room has like four cases in it. Yeah, cases. Yeah, and like and it comes out of your own pocket because like they're not making nobody's making the money they deserve. Not even the director, not even myself. Right, which is like and everybody so that, has to feel exactly. like they're working toward a common yeah, goal. A common goal. Like, yeah. yeah. It also goes back to like, who are the directors and other members of your team that you're yes. working with? Because how are they treating the rest of yes, the crew? How are they Do treating they the rest of the crew? I've, I've worked with people who you know will go an entire shoot and not learn the names of the people who are right. working most closely around them and. You you got to know that they are not liked. Gotta you got to know the head of transpo. Yeah, they, 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 they are not liked, and no one is yeah. going to do right. the extra. They're not going to go the extra foot, much less the extra mile. You Especially know? when they also when they feel like you can do what. Like I mean, I've been on sets where I've cleaned up. I'm doing garbage pickup with everybody. You know what I'm saying? Like if yeah. they feel like you are of them as opposed to like. Doing, they they you know, see exactly, the yeah. effort that you put in. They and, definitely will respect it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they, you, you can garner. When you their, know they can do it better than you, you respect them beyond belief. Right. The, I, like I like our our G and E team. No matter how tough they can be, sometimes at the end of the day, they're so good at what they're doing, they're and we're lucky to have them. And we're doing our best to make their jobs easier. And that's what it is to be a producer. It's just literally we're here to service to help you make your job easier, so the director can do what he wants. And if you don't believe in the project, get the fuck off. And you know these are the things that we you, don't you in do. The team also. Yeah. These are the things you do every yeah. time. I feel like you know going into a movie that you're going to treat these people the same way. You're going to bring these people together. How, what are, what are in your experience, the hurdles that you face that were unexpected? Jared, I would, I would shoot it to you. Like, is there a specific thing that's happened in your career where you're like, I, how do I deal with this? What do I do right well, now? Well, it's always the unanticipated stuff. So like the last movie I did, our lead actor got the flu in the middle of the shoot and it just threw us into a, like a giant tailspin. Uh, Was unable to perform then? Completely or? unable to perform, like just really, really ill. And so it, the shoot, started pushing multiple days where on a day-to-day -day basis we didn't know whether 
the actor was going to be able to work, which, but you're still paying for it. So, uh, and then it was, we were losing locations. We had actors who were then going to go on to other movies. So we started having stop loss issues. And then that's where the job, I mean, I think I love what I do. So I feel like producing is a very easy job because I love it so much. It's those sorts of circumstances though, where it gets incredibly hard very quickly because everybody starts looking at you and I don't have an answer because I don't know when the actor is gonna get better, right? right. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know, and so all you try to do is like, keep up with hoping that you don't start losing crew and that you can still get locations and you can still right. get the actors back, but you're just trying to like keep the reins Reba, is there something that you have uh, conquered or I mean, least I can share something funny and anecdotal. It was yes. on the set of The Romantics, <laughs> and we were supposed to have shot the film in the summer. We were shooting out on the North Shore by the water. Katie Holmes is in this movie, so we have, like, literally, Melissa can share in this, we have the paparazzi, like, floating along the shore trying to get photos of Katie and Tom. So the days are running over for a number of reasons, but some of which is because you're, like, managing photographers trying not to get shots. So the like big culmination of the whole film is when all of the cast, and it was a big ensemble, they run into the water. But we ended up shooting the film in December. So it's after Thanksgiving, it's in December, it's absolutely freezing. And the director was like, they have to all run in the water. They have to strip naked and they have to all run in the water. And so we as a producer were like, oh my God, this is a this is like a, an insurance nightmare, a health nightmare, because <laughs> you had to have all of your water safety out in the water as well. It was midnight, it was cold and there was no place to keep the actors warm. We didn't have any warming tents. The vans couldn't get down because we were on the beach and it was private property and so anyway, so the director insist upon, insisted on it and we were like, we're gonna make this work. Okay, the talent did many, many shots <clears throat> of alcohol <laughs> and they were Tell like, you. we're gonna do this. There was a ton of camaraderie <laughs> among, among the cast. And so all of us, all of the producers, like everyone, we just had all of these massive coats waiting. So when they emerged from the water, we could just like run up to them, give them bear hugs and like get them really, really warm and then shepherd them into a tent. So we did that, we had it on a crane, they all jumped in there naked. They, like, it, they all really, really went for it and like took their tops off and like had a really great time and stayed in the water way longer than they needed to or should have so that the director could get what she wanted. You had a good cast too, I guess. We had a great they cast. Were, they were into it. Yeah. Um, they shoot it over to you guys. Do you have stories that uh, just like encounters? I feel like this problem solving, Murphy's Law is lurking everywhere on a film set. Um, I think uh, Sophia said it before about uh, you know, running like they always want to shoot more on, on uh, one of our films. Antonio likes to shoot nine minute takes and we're shooting 35 and our budget was $250,000. Which film was this on? After then? school we shot uh, 100,000 feet of 35 and anamorphic and uh, all cut traditionally. So I literally had, we, Sean and I were staying in, uh, in dorms while the cast was staying, crew were staying at Holiday Inn and so I'd hide the unexposed film under my bed and then Sean would have the exposed film under his bed. And so when they wanted film, because they kept loading mags, so they were ready. And I was like, no, this is insane. Like, like in, and like, I didn't say no to Tony. I just was like, I want to know, I want, when they want film, I want to know what's going on. Like, I want to know how many mags are loaded, because when I want to sell this film back, I want to make sure it's sealed so that I can get the full price for it. So I didn't want empty mags at the end, you know what I'm saying? Sure. So like, that was a way to like, keep it going while you're running yeah, stuff. Yeah, on Take Shelter, it was Jeff Nichols' second film, and he had shot Anamorphic 35 for Shotgun Stories. And I, <laughs> I, uh, I had a conversation with Jeff, who is a super incredibly smart guy, uh, and already had a fair amount of production experience, and was like very much a realist and very practical. And I straight up asked him, like, how much do you think you're going to shoot every day? And he was like, well, I shot 3,000 feet a day on Shotgun Story, so I can't imagine shooting much more than that. And I was like, OK. <laughs> Even though I, like, when we came down to it, I was just like, OK, we're shooting more than twice what we anticipated, but who do I have to blame but myself? You know, I should know, <laughs> I should know better. And do you really say, you know what, Michael Shannon, we need to move on. 
right. you know, sorry, we're not going to give you one <laughs> Did more. Did you have that you conversation? No, like, we anything? never have that conversation. <laughs> so that's one of the one of the times that I didn't say no. We were just like, well, Kodak here has we this go. great thing where if like you get a list of filmmakers, no, you get like all the NYU students, and you're allowed to get five thousand feet of film. Every NYU, every NYU student. So I got 20 NYU students. Oh so you kidnapped NYU students no, and they, stole they were all, The way we work is like, we have people that want to learn. So like from, from that story, I had a guy there who passed away. His name was Steve Garfinkel, was amazing, and hooked us up. And literally he would like bring us film outside and I would just give him names from like students at NYU at the time. And that's how we hooked it up. But then like with, with Martha, Sean was in the lab and like Ted Hope was our executive and like mentor and guided us. And, and Ted was like, you guys need to wait, you know, make this three million, make it more like genre-esque, whatever. I was like, no. And Sean's like, I'm not sure, I'm gonna go to the lab, maybe I'm, my mind will change. So in the, in, the, in, the, in the interim, I had three interns every day at my house who have a company like ours, they're NYU students. They came to my house even when I wasn't up, at like seven in the morning for a month, and we prepped the entire job ourselves. Transpo, we went up there, photographed everything, where everything was going, so everybody knew. So that when Sean came back, here was a huge book saying, we got it, man, we can do it. We had $100,000. We made that movie for $600,000, shot 35, had a runner every day with film, and we were fully done editing. We had two months after sound and everything, we were in Sundance. We shot August 24th, finished September 24th. Movie was at Sundance in January. So and without interns, there would be no Martha. Without Lucy interns, no, it's like it's a learning hospital. It's like Grey's Anatomy. It's like everybody's trying to like move up and do their thing. And so I took one of my interns who like moved upstate with me a month ahead of time to find all the locations, made him an AP, and it changed his career. So he's only 21 years old. So it's just like, and now he's producing his own things. But he learned everything, like how to hustle. Like you want something for free, like you got to run around the town, you want this house. Sean liked this house. How do we find it? The guy's in Italy. All right, let's knock on every other door, get his number in Italy. So it's just like, it's a hustle. You know, you could take a used car salesman, a drug dealer, and a film producer, and you could rotate the three. It's the <laughs> no, truth. It's, true. it's the that same, is, is it's a job, it's, it's, it's a of, hustle. It's the same kind of instinct. It's, yeah, it's, it's the same exactly kind of the instinct. instinct. But are there moments of compromise that where you stepped in and said, maybe we should do this, that actually worked out you in your mind for the best? I mean, uh, have you seen compromise work in a creative way where you stepped in and it, and it worked? You debate, you debate your, your directors. At the end of the day, it's their choice. Like actors, we have a deal. Like we don't cast actors for money. It's like whoever is best for the part, always, especially with your first films. And that's why it's like Michael Stolbarg, Ezra Miller, Lizzie Olsen. I mean, these are people nobody knew. And it's like the most important, they're the best for the film. I debated with our, one of the directors on cast and I was wrong. But at the end of the day, it's like his choice. Um, I, my trust is in them that they make the right choices. That's the, that's the compromise I made. I think often you feel like when you're casting, you know, with a, with a very small film, you're often aiming for a, lar a bigger name or a more recognizable name. And so when you just make the choice to go for the, for the actor, you know, it might feel like a compromise in the moment, but you look back, I, I feel like anyway, that uh, in the end, the performances yeah. really, really show themselves on screen and it and it kind of wipes away any feeling of like oh I really we really lost something there or anything like that and it becomes like wow aren't we really smart people for finding those that, that those talent. people I really think for cast. me with Gun Hill yeah. Road I mean, we were forced we, you know, into that situation because Gun Hill Road we needed a specific you know Rashad was very specific in what he wanted um, and I, he's, he is a phenomenal you know as far as casting you know, choosing his cast and knowing exactly what he wants he's amazing at it and going with Harmony it was just like all right I know I know how many days she's in I know how the weight of the entire film is going to be on someone who's never been in front of a camera how did you know all in right. that moment I mean how did you know um I I know I was freaking out I remember being like we shot I, I you were gonna rest our whole film on blah 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 you know I'm like let's find someone who's like you know let's let's go in another direction let's find you know an actor that can play like I, I but he was so set on we needed to be authentic we needed to be real and it, 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 it feels good actually to break talent like on a film that you did like I bawled my head off at the Spirit Awards like I sat you know I went with Harmony I sat next to her well first of all my head off. Everybody thinks you're a genius, you know. So it's like, <laughs> so you're smart. like, well, yes, of course I knew they were going to be amazing. Yeah, you know? exactly, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's kind of it. 
the risk is high, but the, re the you know return high, the yeah. return can be great. On the too. other side, no, I don't know if it, if it played out differently, I might be saying something else. <laughs> right. like, oh, I told you, you know, but yeah, it, on this side of it, it feels fantastic to watch that and know that that film and our film made that you know story happen. So, so obviously, there's you're going through a lot. It's a, it can be a turbulent experience making a movie, but as someone who watches them, I don't I don't have to think about that. You know, I just watch great films, and I think about a lot. Uh, the moment that maybe you realize on the set of your movie is that like, we got it. We're making something actually good. Have you had that moment? Does that ever dawn on you or Absolutely. is it just worry, worry, worry Absolutely. the whole time? What Absolutely. can, do you have a specific memory of like, it's clicking, it's I, working? I was, uh, I was working with Craig Zobel on his first film, Great World of Sound. And it, we were shooting in Charlotte, North Carolina in late July and it was 105 degrees. And we were in this freshly paved blacktop parking lot um, shooting the, the kind of climax of the film where the, the two characters who are you know ostensibly like record producers but realize that they basically have been drawn into a pyramid scheme con um, have been hung out to dry by, by the supposed record company and are stranded uh, with no way to get home and they, they, the, the tensions in their relationship kind of bubbled to the surface. And there was a moment where we were shooting on a very long lens across this like, basically like griddle, you know, that we were shooting on and in, the, in this like broiling sun. Um, but the scene and our characters, you know, they really clicked and you could see even on a monitor this big at the camera side that it was a really extraordinary performance, and uh, and you just knew that the film would all of a sudden have the weight that it needed, you know, because in the story up until that point, it's it's relatively frivolous, and there's a lot of opportunity for kind of situational comedy, but when the shit really hit the fan in those characters' lives, like those actors were right there and really, really nailed it, and you could just you could feel it, you could feel it. You know, you mentioned Riva that. Um you, you don't stop worrying until you get to see it in a movie theater. But do you, being in deep, still get to engage with those movies in, a, in an entertainment way? Do you all feel that, like you can still love and appreciate this product that you have made on some level where you're straddled between commerce and creed? When you're in love with it, you, you, getting, I mean, you get to see your film a Technicolor like in the theater, but you never get to see it that big with a live audience. So when you see a movie bigger, you're getting to see it, like all the nuances, and you get to see it differently. So first time you make a movie, you're in there sweating your balls off because you protect it so nobody sees the movie. Only people that see the movie are the people you collaborate with and you don't want anybody to see it and then you show it at can, and then everybody sees it, for investors, everyone sees it for the first time. But as it gone on, we've learned not to be so precious and then like at the same time, like when you, you're in love with the film so much and you've been involved in every cut and everything and you're supportive and then when you see it on the big screen, you're like, wow. Like, it's it's a when it's a people different are experience. laughing when you were hoping they would laugh right. when you were working on the script five years earlier and you're like this is a funny line and then five years later you have you hear, had that moment oh, yeah, yeah. Well, the best is when you then when you don't know if it's funny not even thought of it as right. funny and then people are laughing and you're like well it's kind of funny people find something yeah, else it's, it's some, different something more yeah than and you like with Simon Killer like you know I didn't realize how sexually graphic it was I know you had the experience of the compliance like at Sundance I mean. We all, I was, like, my friends and I were all crying at the end, you know, like, it was such a, uh, an important film for us to make. I mean, I cried for other reasons. My mother's name was at the end before she passed, and, you know, and like, it, but it was a, my director did that as the last beat of the movie, but it was also just like, we slaved over this, man. I mean, we shot with real prostitutes and real brothels and, like, hustled, you know, and, like, went down for each other, and then, like, you're there, and you, and you see everything, and you're just like, God damn, it's so sure. good. I'd love to hear more about that gauntlet of going through the movie and then showing it to people, and, like, you've slaved over this picture, and now people are having a, a reaction. You don't know what it's going to be until they actually do it. You probably know best from Compliance at Sundance, which was just, like, an explosive experience. What was that like? Um, it was, I mean, we had an idea that not everyone would like the film. Um, we had no idea people would arbitrarily yell at us, particularly in a festival setting that is very clearly uh, centered around Q and A's, director Q and A's at every single screening. So that was, I mean, you know, um, what was that one, one thing of my Craig said in the beginning. He was like, 
you may not like this movie, but as long as you stay after to like tell me why, I, I mean, thought that was great. That like, was, I mean, well, that was in the aftermath, kind of. You know, it was that like, was great, though. I mean, the main the main thing that was disappointing about that experience in terms of having people just shout out was that they then fled the theater, so that there wasn't any further dialogue. It was just, it was, it was not Q and A. It was just we're gonna yell at you and then leave, so we don't tell you. In any nuanced way, why, you know what yeah, we're thinking, or yeah. why we're upset, or right. you know, it. I mean, I understand it's a different experience if you're in a regular movie theater and you're not expecting that kind of interplay. But Sundance requires their directors to be at every Q and A, and and it's an opportunity to have a dialogue with the audience. So it's, it is very interesting. I mean, on the other hand, I, I think how unexpected it. That reaction was, that was for everyone. That was unexpected. I mean, you have you have you ever had? Have, we, we I know, guess you guys know, have had people yell know, at you. It's always going to be polarizing. I mean, yeah, but, but that's the best. That's thing why they make doing films. The, that's exactly why it is because you're part of something progressive. You're doing something different. You know what I'm saying? Like you made a movie well, that's going to evoke an emotion, right. whether I mean, it's good or not. It's, it's, it's like yeah, not it's amazing. It evokes well, a conversation, and yeah. hopefully, and it, a discussion. yeah, and hopefully you're thinking about that it's an actual conversation, right? That right. so like, it's an actual like, dialogue. We are conditioned very differently. We all grew up in movies in America through escapism. In Europe, the government pays for their movies, so they're everybody's conditioned to go to the theater to uh, to uh, to challenge themselves. Do you understand? So it's like there's a different history there, different movies coming out of there. And we all grew up on the Goonies and Back to the Future, and we have that escapism. But going to film school and discovering Hanukkah and Bruno Dumont, you know, and Gaspar Noé, it's like these people are making things that are really hard to follow, but there's something to be said. So how do you cross the, how do you bridge the gap where people are being challenged at the same time they're being entertained? And that's why. I try and do what we do because it doesn't always hit, but there's something right. to be said about right. challenging the end, and you're Basically, helping them find the formula in order to do something to the progressive. Yeah. The, the yeah. worst thing about producing movies is when you produce things that's already been done before, right. and like being a part of that's kind of lame. Reva, do you have a moment in your career where you <laughs> have seen a movie, like Why people not? have had that reaction one way or another, either that it was expected, that it was unexpected, or screaming at the director afterwards. I've never had the luxury of that. <laughs> <laughs> luxury. <laughs> yeah. not, not, not that people are, you know, ready to burn down the theater after seeing your movie, but just that, that you have created something that is eliciting that reaction from people. And, and that kind of brings you either joy or an unexpected shock, or you've seen an audience watch your movie. Sure. I mean, I came up as a producer through post-production, so I have spent hours and hours and hours watching our movies over and over and over again. So I would say that, you know, a film that it, I helped to produce, which makes me cry every time I see it, was a film called Grace is Gone. So I would watch this movie in a small little room and, like, see John Cusack have to tell his daughters that their mother, you know, is gone. And every time I'd be moved to tears. And so then, you know, we take the film to Sundance. And I have no idea. Like, I've just been watching it in, like, these tiny screens and DI rooms and basically alone. But, you know, to sit and watch that movie with a theater and have people, you know, hear like the sniffles and to hear the whimpering and then you know for that film to have like elicited that same sort of emotional response from a big audience was really awesome I mean it was really amazing sure so and Jared you mentioned hearing laughter when you know we're making a joke in this movie and I want it to play and it does play what what was that experience like for you it, something it's just exciting I mean you feel like you know you've given birth to like a smart handsome child you know, <laughs> sort of, people autistic. like it you know I mean whether you know even if even if just just people responding means like you've done something right I've also made movies that uh, were awful and then you're watching it and you're cringing along with yeah. the audience do you feel like you've made something that wasn't digested the way you expected it to be that didn't play exactly yeah, sure. the same way and or is there something specific that you can recall that just like uh, I'm not I, I don't want to name Names. Names, but uh, but sure, but I think it's you know, but it also then goes back to to whether you felt the team gelled or right. not, uh, and sometimes you don't you you feel like it is gelling, and then partway through the shoot, like people's personalities change under pressure, uh, and they don't handle pressure well, and they like start to feel like a, like there there's a gang mentality going on when there isn't, and like. It's a lot like sports, man. It's like being it's a, a soccer lot. team. It's like when you're off the field, it's different. When you're on the field, you're working together. And it's like, and it's going to give you that energy to go yeah. the next step because it's not over once you show it at a, 
at a, a I festival. Know. I love to see my Jesus films. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see Gun Hill Road at Sundance. I was getting, I was somewhere else. Like I just, I get nauseated. Like I just have to get through. Like I wait for people to come out. And I'm like, oh, it was great. And I'm like, okay, I'll go see it the next screen. But I couldn't, I can't see. I stood at the back of compliance yeah, and like people can't. just walked out. And, I like, and I, I was like, like, like you know, sit next to the director and you worry about how they feel. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you want to make sure that they're happy yeah. with everything. And like, I mean, yeah, I mean, I remember I lost like 10 pounds in the can screen of, 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 uh, of after school. In the screening? <laughs> I'm just saying. You were 10 pounds in no, the theater. No, in, my suit wasn't fitting when I got up. No, because Tony kept grabbing me. Yeah. And like we, we printed like traditionally, so our sound was printed onto it. Right. So before we left, it's anamorphic, so it's always kind of weird. So we printed our sound onto it, and the sound we heard it before we left wasn't playing right. And it's like, it, and so Tony stayed two extra days, and like we didn't hear the print after they right. fixed it. So he literally flew in with the print three hours before the screening, and it was only playing in mom. You can never stop worrying. And, 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 and it worked. We had, we, he was like, don't get up. They hated it. He thought coughing in the theater meant that journalists were communicating how bad it was. And basically, <laughs> people got up and, and left. He's like, don't get up, don't get up. And then when we got up, we, we sat there like this, and we just heard applause. We looked back, and the rafters, so standing ovation, and it carried out into the hallway and out onto the street. You know, I think the people who work on movies directors especially, and I think you guys would agree, that they don't want to have to think about anything but what they're in at that moment, making the movie. But I imagine that your role in the, in the production has to be, how are people going to accept this? What could the, does this have an audience? How is it going to be distributed? Should I make those decisions? Do those decisions get made early on? Or, or are you thinking about the audience this movie's going to have when it's finally done? No, not really. I mean, not with the first films, the personal ones, like the ones that are, they're like, when you're working with a studio and you're writing the script and you have to like abide by certain guidelines, but when you're doing your first movies, like first two for the director, it's about what they want to make. It's not, you don't think, you do one step at a time. If you get too ahead of yourself, you're out of the moment. But you want them to make the movie, but your goal seems to be like, this movie needs to get out into the world. Yeah, if you respect their voice you're there, and you give them what they want, you stay in the moment, then if their voice is fully executed, then you hope your investment's worth that. You're going blind. But you, don't you want to know that it's going to work? Well, filmmaking, I think, is, is very, you know, someone, the exec told me before, you guys make films, we make movies. And there's a distinct difference. <laughs> so I think filmmaking, is an organic process where a, a, a director writer is engaged in something that moves them to the point that they're willing to write it, be passionate about it, carry it for many years, you know, galvanize a team, go to the producers and create this team to support this vision. And it's the statement of that that becomes more important. And then you figure out the pieces after, I think, for the most part. And in this world, it's very much about what the, the passion the person had for this particular story and then wanted to tell it and then people buying into it. And I think people buy into the person and the story more so than necessarily where what the end result is going to be. I think this is definitely an investment in the film space. Uh, this, it seems to be more of an investment in the person, the visionary, the creative, and the, and the story. But I mean, at the end of the day, it's a business. Don't they want to know that they're going to get the return the business, they need? Yeah, but the business is like you're trusting this guy or this woman to lead a team, right? And like, if you just give your faith in them, then like, and they can make what they believe is good and the idea that you like. But I think you know, every director and every producer has different feelings on this. I, as a producer right now, I want to make movies that people want to see. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean that I want to in any way sort of sell out and like, oh, this, I'm going to put, you know, the next hot Disney star in this movie. And so, you know, then mm -hmm. that's the kind of movie I want to make. No, but I don't. I don't want to make movies that one person wants to go see. You have see. to take the right steps to get there. Absolutely. So in order to, Absolutely. In order to I, get there, you need to be able to like support that individual voice, let them experiment to find it, and then you go to like Fox Searchlight. And you Fox work, Searchlight is like the best home for these things. Yeah, I think there are certain directors, just to complete this thought, certain directors that want to make movies and they don't care if anybody ever goes right. to see their movie mm -hmm. and that's fine that's a certain style of filmmaking and then there are other directors that have important things to say but they still want people to see their movies so i, I think it's been really interesting because um for the directors that i've worked with like with with craig zobel and jeff nichols they each made their first films on a literal shoestring which i'm sure we've all experienced but it, to a certain extent because it was for so little, there is a lot less pressure in terms of expectations on return. Uh, there were no expectations in terms of any kind of like critical, uh, you know, take on the on what was coming out of people who are completely unknown. 
But with their second films, I mean, with both Take Shelter and Compliance, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty risky material in both cases and, um, and much bigger scopes and bigger budgets. And both of those directors were smart enough to acknowledge and like think very carefully about the fact that they were that they did have obligations to their investors that okay. they that they did want their movies to be seen because to a certain extent both of their first films were had very very small audiences and I think that, that takes growth as a director you right mean, and, I and that's that, an investment in the that's an investment in the person right. as opposed to an investment in the product and I think the model is very different. When right. you're invested in a person's growth and you know that there's a lot of But they also kind of like took lessons from... And, and they, yeah. Right. And, that's, and then that's where trust extrapolated. Comes back in, yes. back that, that but that whole, is like, what I'm saying. That's the, the problem. Right. The I hate to put that nasty word on it because it's a terrible word, but they are the product. You're believing I in think them. that that's a realization ex- that they have right. between sure. the first and one and the second one. If you can't film, be like, you know? you know, you can't just jump on any random director and say, I'm going to direct this movie with, you know, big movie that everyone's going to see because you have no experience with them. You know what I'm saying? And they, yeah, it's like you can't, you, you, there's directors out there like Joachim Trier, who I love and would love to work with, and now he's doing huge movies after doing two great movies, you know? Well, that's like, these are people I'm fans of that I'd like to work with. I'm not going to, like, take a risk on somebody and bring them into a big world and then jeopardize myself. It seems like back in the day, the Hollywood model was to find directors that had a vision and then cultivate that person's vision, you know, and they start with a movie that may or may not hit and then they learn from it and they continue to grow. I don't think that, you know, I think when you look at from a profit and loss and just strictly from numbers, I don't think Hollywood is <laughs> engaging in that model anymore. No, they did. I mean, they did the '70s after French New Wave. Yeah. The '70s was like the, the greatest. The '70s was exactly. Film, like, I think in America, in independent space, I think the ones that work is your model. I think that we, but that's again a very limited. Yeah, but there's Alex Arlovsky, man. Like okay. Blue Valentine. Like uh, I mean, there's so many. But the, Jay is, are those movies but finding question, audience? Is it, is it, a niche? Yeah. But, I mean, do you see beginners? But, do you see? But the percentage. Uh, like, Meets cut off. Like I think, what's the percentage of that versus the overall whole? Yeah, the only strong survive, man. Like it, it's true. <laughs> it's like you rest. The rest get weeded out. No, for real. There's something to be said about that. You know, yeah. it's like look at Alex. Yeah. Look at the directors that are. Look at the producers that are continually working with the same directors. I mean, look at Craig Zobel. Look at you know, like you working with Nichols. Like like there's something to be said. Look at Jay and Lars. Look at ne- Anish with his Anish filmmakers with Kelly, with Kelly yeah. Reichard. I mean, look at Neil Cope with like Gus Van Zandt. Like. I mean, these are people that have been around for a long time that continually generate things that catch your eye. Mm-hmm. And, and and sometimes they work with different directors, sometimes they take risks. I mean, they're just like, I don't know, man. We share a lot of crew, and I got a lot of respect for a lot of these people. I mean, Jamie, oh, Lynette Howell. I mean, come on. Like, so if I'm a movie watcher and I, I want to watch indie movies and someone's continually working in the business for a decade, I know they're probably pretty good at this point. Or you see, like, when you take, like, I have, you know, a friend of mine uh, is an actress and talk about the movie she takes and she takes a risk because she liked the guy's first movie but who's producing it? Do they have movies, do their movies have legs? Do they have a history at Cannes? Do they have a history at Sundance? Ha- have they had a movie distributed? Even though that movie, got, you know, the producer is so important in terms of keep, keeping the life and loving that director. As corny as that sounds. It's well it's truth, interesting right? that you say that because I think obviously uh, a lot of general movie goers, they know directors, they know actors, and they want to consistently see their work. Would it behoove them, you think, to, s- to seek out producers and really follow the work? Do you feel like you have enough a stamp on your work to say like, I'm, I'm setting a bar for myself, like come see my work because I'm going to try and consistently make I think it. you got to come up with people you come up with. Like a buddy of mine was Chuck Close's assistant for six years when I was 18, I was living with him. And he was, he's a painter and Chuck said to him, like he's like, I should I show it pace? And he's like, no, you want to show it like Rivington, like you want to come up with people at the same time as you because then you're on equal playing field and you can say things to each other and learn and with each other and not each overcompensate. Other. And, and you can trust. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think my, the biggest thing for me is the trust thing. You can trust each other because you went through the same experience experiences and sometimes the failures are more beneficial if, yeah. you, if you stay as a team yeah. you gotta the fail. failures are more important than successes because now there's a shared you analyze your failures far more than you analyze your successes yes. shared so, lessons learned. exactly yeah. if you can create and, and cultivate that relationship and then make mistakes together and then and learn and then go into the second project you guys are so much more stronger yeah. going into the second project and you're building loyalty and, and like exactly. ethics and stuff so you always no matter what situation you're in you use the same cast director you know you, you like you have faith people that work for you for nothing same publicists who did it for free because they believed in you and you just keep that respect sure like uh, part know, of what's also oh, great though is like being in new york there's such a thriving film community i mean it feels like it's it's really closely knit now than more than it's been in in a long time 
I think it's being leaned on a lot heavier. I think like we make I think dramas and, and heavier, more weighted stuff. It seems like it's it's now all in the indie space. I feel like studios and other things, and they're not risking as much to do that kind of work. Searchlight did in terms of. Distribute, like yeah, distribute. Distribu it is a distributor, but even, I'm talking about like from a production standpoint, in-house cultivating all the way through there. I, I think is a lot less now. Maybe I'm wrong in that, but it seems that there's a lot less dramatic work, you know, happening or being created. And it seems that it's a lot of it's leaning in the independent space. Well, it's interesting you say that because Reba, you you threw out the term selling out, and I kind of wonder if there's an allure with that, you know, like. Yes, Your movie could like sell. Yeah, well, that's the like thing. Sell. Is selling out like a real thing anymore? Is that something that you face, I mean, like that you're challenged by? No, I don't know many <laughs> like New York indie producers that, who so, are yeah, like we, selling out. Yeah. No, I was just. I don't think no. there's any. I think before the bottom dropped out in 2008, to a certain extent, there was there was a lot of easy money, mm -hmm. and it was a lot easier to get projects projects that maybe shouldn't have passed the bar at, at, at a much higher budget level than really was needed. Um, but then the bottom dropped out of everything and right. it really it really put the onus on directors, on producers, on, you know, and that's kind of where the projects really, I felt like got weeded out, you know, where it's, uh, it's like only the ones that you're really, really going to kill yourself for are they are those the ones that are going to make it through right. you know because well, the movie i would like movies that i would have made for 10 million dollars five years ago and now have to figure out how to make for two and a half right. Right. but you have faith in it that you'll fight to do it, it. i mean it depends you know like not every project kind depend. of makes that bar yeah. you know cut like uh not every not every project is like that you know some projects are like because it works. Ten million change. dollars. The work for, if, on the producer side doesn't really change. You know, you health health insurance. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> other projects are like, kill myself for a year and maybe it gets into Sundance and maybe it gets sold. Sometimes the answer is yes and sometimes the answer is no. I'm really sorry, but I'm sure there's someone else out there for you. you know? um, so you mentioned that the landscape has changed, you know, financing is evolving and changing, and I think the way people are actually watching your movies is changing, uh, thanks to the internet, thanks to Netflix and Amazon Prime and all these sort of things. How, how does that change your job, the beginning, middle, end of this process of making a movie and like knowing where it could end up, how it'll end up? Distribution, it's a totally different game at this point. The distribution landscape has, has made things more difficult because I, I think at the end, trying to figure out with all the split rights that you now have to deal with it's not just you do like one deal with a theatrical person who's going to handle the dvd now it's like there are separate companies for web there are separate companies you, like you do a cable deal and maybe that has a vod deal or you have a different sort of vod deal and then there's uh domestic theatrical and then but then you also have to deal with the whole world so i think it's become complicated as well because none of this has been going on long enough for there to be any real modeling. Wow, so, yeah. so, like the last movie I did, uh, or the last movie I had out was Rob Reiner's movie, The Magic of Belle Isle, which Magnolia released, and Magnolia's a great company. But we decided to release it, or they decided to release it, uh, five weeks prior to the theatrical release on VOD. And for $9.99. Why? Well, no one... Why five weeks? Because because it's margin just, call because did, that's just margin call did so well in that model. The what? Margin, margin call. Did super well. Yeah, so that was something that people were emulating. And now Bachelorette. Yeah, Bachelorette is just killing it. Also, not many people know about this. As much as Bachelorette's making, so is that Cherry movie that IFC has. It's making just as much as Bachelorette. Yeah. I mean, the ideal situation. I mean, you have your agent who sells your domestic rights, and then you get your agent gets you your foreign sales. You hopefully end up with Fortissimo, you know, or you know, or you end up with like Wild Bunch. Wow. Yeah, so essentially, and then you hopefully have a good sales agent, they give you an estimate of how much you're going to sell for, and they hope they hit that number. Yeah. And then and your best situation is when you sell, sell world. Although, That's honestly, it. It, it is kind of a great upside now that things have settled down a little bit. Like, there is, I mean, I remember feeling like the atmosphere in 2009 at Sundance was just abject panic, you know, and people were making grand speeches about the death of independent film and, and getting into big fights and panels and stuff like that. And um, I think things have settled down a little bit. And for films that are made on a really small level, it, it relieves a little bit of the pressure because it's like, well, maybe we won't get that ideal fantasy theatrical release and like platform rollout and 
but maybe we can pay our investors back through all these right. different channels. Aren't more people channels, seeing it you know? that way too? In, yeah. in a lot of ways, I think. I think you know? more people are seeing it. It's probably not monetized well. The challenge is that there are people, like for me, the, like the next fix deals and certain deals are like, you're talking about a $5,000 or $10,000 license deal, but 100,000, 200,000 people are seeing it streaming. So like it's right. being monetized very differently than what you would hope to they have do. They to figure out how to report that money. And, and how that. to report it properly. It just It's just this funky right. space right. that this, I don't think but the distributors there, have caught up to. But there are companies like Magnolia and IFC who have worked out things very well yeah. in terms of, and also each of those companies have like great platforms yeah. for all yeah. of those different, you know, to and take advantage of all the company just formed this new company, Radius, and they're right. Right. So and I mean, becoming I, a model. You know, it's, when, when you're talking about something like sub $1 million, it's, I, I think that it's it's a little bit of a relief when you have no idea how people are going to react to your movie that it's yeah. like, well, maybe we can at least like sell it on VOD, you know, and or that that option's open to us, that if the movie doesn't open theatrically, that it's not just completely dead in the water. And, but they're you know, doing, they're, like you so. said, 2008, 2009, it was like the most people would pay for sub a million dollars was like 50 grand. Now they're paying six figures and low sevens. Yeah, the, and the market's definitely bounced back after people. Amazing. <laughs> you can, you, I, this is my own, like, kind of, like, measure of, the, of how, how, how much money is rolling through Sundance is, like, you know, 2009, there were no parties and no party girls, you know, and 2011, <laughs> it was, yeah. boy, were there a lot of party the girls. Of they party were girls, back yeah. in the high their, heels and the the high heels in mink coats and, 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 bandage, yeah. Yeah, and bandage skirts, you know, like the size of a, yeah. a bandage and um, in 20 degree weather. And you're like, there, somebody's got some money somewhere, yeah. you know. So and, the wilder um, the parties at Sundance, the better the industry. I, I, I mean, it, there's well, every year, not we always, nothing, every but there's got to be a was bad, We had great parties. No, but. But they were great because then it was kind of like more focused back on just the real people working in the industry right. instead of all the various hangers on. The hangers, yeah. You know, is is a little, you had to pay more for your own boots. Sure. You know? Is something like Sundance still an important <laughs> part of your process? Do you want to go to the festival, get the VOD deal? I mean, is Sundance giving you exposure, audience exposure as Sundance, well? Sundance gives you a laurel. I mean, it gives you it gives you validation. It and does, then it yeah. gives you, and then also the people at Sundance are just really supportive, they're, especially yeah, through the labs. They're an incredible family. They're, yeah, we're we're now we're the uh, alumni uh, board people, me, Sean, and Tony, and like they like this the institute, and it's like it's a really amazing what they do and how much they, they fight to get money and, and grants for all of us. And they're always thinking about you. You don't yeah. even realize it that you have this ally in your corner you until you get the an calls, email that's yeah, like, they're making. Hey, I was telling somebody about your project, and I think you should apply for this grant, and you're like. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, okay. Great. Thank you. You know, and yeah. and they they are thinking about you. Once you, you know? it's part. It's a family. Once you're in there, it really is in, incredible. And it's the same thing with Can too. It's like Can Can supported us. We, like we have six film there in five years, and they supported us before no one else, nobody else would. We, he made a short about a girl selling in Virginia on eBay. Every festival around the world was scared of it, especially America. And then Can out of nowhere accepted, made it for a thousand bucks, and he won first prize. And like they they took an, a risk, but once you're there too, you go to the residency program, and they support you. I mean, it's it's, it's what it is. It's like you but need the that support. They seem great for the filmmakers and the producers and the people who are in this collective, actually in the industry. Yeah. But, but for people on the outside who want to consume the movies, do you feel like that environment is changing now? With I can fund a Kickstarter and see the movies that I want to make. I can re demand it and play it in my theater, like. The audience is more engaged and demanding. Well, than the festivals ever themselves are specific audiences. I mean, in Utah, you have like mostly locals, and especially when the screenings are in Salt Lake City. I can you have schools that come down? You know, in, in San Sebastian, you have a crazy court. It's very specific places, but they usually put your films in those festivals before they're released because that's when you get the most press. But do you feel like you'll have to consider the audience more in the beginning when you're making the movie? Like, do I have to have a relationship with more, them while I'm making it so that when there's more they money want involved, it down the line? When there's more money involved, you have to deal with, like, big money. You have to, like, fight for every thought. And, the, and hopefully you're working with a good studio. They debate with you, like, intellectually audience. It's, they're not debating with people who have no experience. You're debating with like some of the best in the industry. So it will change when money, when your money gets bigger and you have much more responsibility you're opening up at 3,000. Well, there ever be a... He's saying something a little different. Yeah. He's saying like with the Kickstarter or with, you know, the ability to like engage your audience, like does it now require you to kind of pre-vet? Can you deliver the product directly to them almost at this point? I mean, I think that, I think people are trying to do that. I think I mean, can. look at Helvetica is kind of always held up as, as a prime example of someone who 
cultivated a very specific audience and made it a huge success story on his own terms, you know. Uh, Font enthusiasts. Yeah, exactly. And it was like graphic design people. I mean, Helvetica is like, it's, it was kind of like the oh, the only thing people were talking about in 2009 when nothing else was going on. Right, They're right. like, that, oh, that guy figured it out. I, I want to wrap up with something cuddly and, and sweet, uh, which is, I think a lot of people get into this business because they love movies and they're inspired by the people who make them. And I'm kind of curious if there are things that you've seen in your past or people you've worked with that kind of pushed you to want to produce your own movies and uh, specific things from the past that, that inspired you. My friends, man. My friends inspire us to be better. Um, like to always raising the bar and always like we don't let we can be safe because we won't let anything into out into the world unless we all really like it and supportive. And then on like a cheesy note, the Rolling Stones, man. You know? The Stones. Yeah, dude. Like the, <laughs> the Stones. Like just like you know they, they, you know, for 40 years, 50 years they've been doing it and they've had problems internally. I mean, but they still make it work because at the end of the day they're brothers and they love each other. It's like and they make great music together and. I mean, it's really what you, what, what most people that are in this for the right reasons do it for. The majority of people are not in this for the right reasons. The majority of people are in this for vanity. Everyone here is. Yeah, but I'm just, I'm saying, like, it's a lot of it's for vanity, and it's like Kevin Bacon said it on the Actors Studio. It's like I was getting laid before I was famous. Nothing changed for me in that way. It's like I don't do it for that. You know, a lot of it's like we're in a very independent movies are a high risk investment, and the investors usually get into it. You know, we've been very fortunate because they want to support the arts. They want to be part of something progressive, and that's the tip you hopefully can sell on. And the idea is just to be able to have a family from it and continually being creative and being challenged with your mind all the time and doing what people you love. And that's the cuddly reason why I do it. Yeah, I mean, I, th I, mean, I, I learned it really from my uncle uh, owned a pharmacy, and he loved this pharmacy like a child. And I used to work at the pharmacy when I was a kid, and he said, Jared, look, you're going to spend the majority of your life working, so you better figure out to do something you really love, because otherwise you're going to look back and you're going to say, why did I do what I did? And I just love what I do. It was just, I, found, I fell into it because it was, again, that like finding something that was both creative and, and had a uh, commerce driven. Totally. Other movies inspire me. Like, yeah. good movies inspire me. Like, the movies that everybody here is making, those inspire me to want to yeah. keep making movies. And, yeah, yeah because completely. there's always a different, there's always yeah, another story so to envious. tell. I yeah, me too. So envious. Like, good, yeah. I, like, would, why didn't I do that movie? It took me months, it took me months to see Beast of the Southern Wild. And uh, oh. afterwards, I went up to Dan Jammy. He's like, what'd you think? I was like, fuck you, man. Like, and he, and he was like, awesome. And I was just like, oh, why? Like, no. yes, I yeah, want to, yeah. you know. I think their films, I won't quote them, <laughs> but I think it's when you see films and you're like, I want to make that. I want to make something that's that impactful or I want to do, I want to do that, and I think when you see certain teams, you say, "I want to have a team that looks like it feels totally like that." And right. I think that's, at least for me, that's what in, in, inspires me or continues to make me go back at it and say, "Okay, let's. How? What can I learn from? But I, 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 at least I think I know what the goal looks like, and I have films that I'm like, "That's the goal," and I have seen like partnerships. I think their partnership, Josh and his team, I, I, that's the goal, and I think that's what inspires me. I have this like, I have this uh, fantasy as somebody. Uh, coming out of high school as someone who really didn't understand how movies were made at all, I had this like very vague notion that I wanted to be a director. And I really didn't understand that that entailed talking to actors. So <laughs> I got to film school, which was a struggle to get to because my parents just were so scared of how uncertain a future that was. Um, and I realized that, you know, I wasn't the best at talking to actors, but I could basically do everything else. And so I can make it happen so someone else could talk to actors. And that, just the fact that, you know, that I got this chance and then I kept on getting chances and every every day is a new chance. And it's just, that that's like as cheesy as I can get, but yeah. it, you know, it really You're telling is, a different story every time you take on right. a project. And every know? day is different, every day is yeah. new. There's there's no monotony to it. There's even, even the, the bad times are like, well, they have to end sometime, you know, right. so it's like, so then I can go on, move right. on to something good, you know, and um, I don't know, I, it's, I, I, it's, it's really hard because there's no money, 
you know, you don't get an independent film for vanity or money. Right. So what are you doing it for? You know, and it's it's got to be something else. What right. I find I remind myself is that I'm actually doing something. I'm living somebody's dream. Like somebody somewhere is dreaming about being able to make a movie. And right. we get the honor of I, I feel, I, I'm, I'm somebody's so, I, dream. I know it's Sometimes like. Sometimes it feels <laughs> unreal. Like people are dreaming this. And it's not necessarily what we would have dreamed. If I looked back and if I told the high school version of myself that I would be where I was, I wouldn't, I would not believe it. I would, I would never (laughs) believe it. Like, you're going to get to go to Cannes, you're going to get to, you're going to get to go to Sundance and have a family there amongst like professionals who do this really well. Mm -hmm. I would never believe it. I never had a vision beyond maybe I can get a job loading the copier in an office on a movie. You know? Dream big, dream big. Right. So, like that was already the pinnacle, you know, so. So it's not just the free meals. It's, you can all, I mean, ultimately it's like, it's endlessly challenging, it's always fun, you get to meet wonderful people, there's like a healthy camaraderie and, and competition, and I think we all just sort of thrive off of each other, it's great. Uh, maybe I should let these bells stop. High noon. It feels like it's tolling us yes, out. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, so then there's no time to wrap this yes. up. <laughs> I have a producer job. What did the producer get for his kids for Christmas? Your bike. Nothing, but he swears he'll make it up on the back end. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Point alpha, take really two. Good. <laughs> so he always has good jokes. Always has good jokes. Mark.